All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from a rainy San Diego. Uh, and today I'm joined from Philadelphia by Bill Butler. How are you doing, Bill? Doing well, John. Yeah, and Bill's the CEO at Journey Sales. Journey Sales smart rooms enable you to engage with your customer by providing always on high value content aligned with their stage in the buying process. And so, what we're going to talk today about is the whole idea of digital selling, what digital selling is, and why it's more important than ever. So, um, Bill, let's face it, like digital has it is invading all aspects of our lives. And in, in companies, it's it's invaded marketing and a lot of other areas within the company. But sales is always a little bit slow sometimes to adapt to it. And certainly when business is good, you tend to go, yeah, maybe we need to do some digital initiatives, but you know, they can wait because life is good. So now we're going through quite a, a, an upheaval uh, with the coronavirus. But anyway, even absent that, we really needed to start looking at, at the concept of digital selling. So do you want to explain to the audience what you mean by digital selling? Yeah, John, when we looked at the market, you know, we saw, as you mentioned, a lot of other functions and companies obviously beginning to be, you know, transformed with digital. You know, marketing automation we saw happen 10 to 12 years ago you know, the SDR and BDR function, there were some mm -hmm. great tools that were developed in the last five years, but kind of left out there in the cold has really been what we would call kind of traditional sales and account management. So we took, took a look at that space and said, you know, can we create that kind of B2C-like experience, but for the B2B customer? Uh, now, it's not going to be and look like, you know, your Amazon Prime experience. It needs to be able to support complex selling, uh, complex decision making, you know, a longer customer journey, more people involved, more content. But we really took it based on that premise and said, let's take the B2C model and then create the capabilities around the B2B market. And how would you, uh, how would you, uh, kind of comfort salespeople who've been hearing a lot of stuff about, oh, AI is going to replace you, bots are going to replace you. And when they hear something like digital selling, they think, oh, great. So this is another thing that's going to replace me. Yeah, you know, it's right from the very beginning, and I think this has been validated by our customers time and time again, mm -hmm. is this isn't really a replacement, it's really an augmentation. And in many cases, what our customers tell us, it actually makes that human side of selling even better. Because, you know, what, what digital really does, it does the things that your sales reps either don't do well or don't want to do. <laughs> you know, things like, you know, one is providing a, a, an experience because you can't. Today, mm -hmm. your experience is email, it's video conferences, it's, you know, phone calls. We have a mishmash of experiences here. If we can put that all into one digital experience, you know, we've accomplished something. The other side is really just on execution. You know, there's playbooks built behind this. So I can kind of, as they say, set it and forget it. So I can create a set of plays that are really specific for, specific for that client and allow that to execute. Because we know how tough it is sometimes for salespeople, they get distracted, we have one idea, I move on to another account and I forget and don't execute on some of these other things. You know, digital takes a lot of that away. So it's really designed to, again, do the things that sales reps historically haven't done very well. Yeah, and I think I think important is the part that uh, you know digital processes, whether it's what you're doing or what we do with our CRM and automating, a lot of these routine or mundane or repetitive tasks is what we're really doing at the end of the day is allowing the, the salesperson to be more effective and to focus on high value activities as opposed to, as you say, trying to organize things or create a customer experience, which is not something that we're really paying them to do at the end of the day. We're paying them really to build a relationship. Yeah. And one of the things too is, you know, we, we talk about this a lot, I think, in the broader sales world, but I think... You know, sometimes it's more words and less action, but we talk about you know, supporting the customer's journey, supporting the mm -hmm. buyer's journey, selling, you know, selling to the way the buyer wants to buy. In many cases, we just resort back to selling by our process, right? Yeah. But what we did with, with the journey sales of smart rooms, we actually took it from the outside in. We said, okay, how would we create the consummate customer experience first? Let's understand the customer's requirements and then build it back inwardly to sales. Because we knew if, if customers would come in and appreciate it, you know, sales rep would show up. Sales will go wherever the customers are, digital or otherwise, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. that's why we really try to focus on perfecting the customer experience. 
And especially now, if you think about, okay, there's a lot of people have been selling virtually for a while now, uh, but obviously there's a lot more people who are going to be doing that for the foreseeable future. And in reality, most people, when they think about selling virtually, they just think about, well, I'm going to send some emails and I'll probably try and use this Zoom thing to replace my face-to-face meeting. But they don't really think of it beyond that. They don't think of it as an opportunity in itself. Right, right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I had I had the pleasure of working many years ago with a gentleman who he, he took, it was WebEx at the time, but yeah. he perfected how to deliver online presentations. And it was magical. Like you, the 99% of people kind of do it all the same way. You know, mm-hmm. they show themselves, they flip up a presentation, they talk through it. But this guy used drawings and things like that back and forth to, to, to make really that online presentation, a theatrical experience. He was phenomenal at it. I haven't seen anyone do it like him before, but mm-hmm. it's that type of idea. How do you kind of continue to push the envelope right now that says, how do we now bring our customers closer to us in a time where we can only really engage with them digitally? And that's all, that's all part of the magic behind this. And let's face it, uh, you need to bring some consistency to the process, right? Because you, if you just leave everybody to their own devices, uh, as you mentioned, customer experience, the customer experience is going to fluctuate wildly depending on who they engage with or at what point they engage with. So being able to bring a level of consistency is critical. Yeah, in, in many ways, too. You know, in, in, in some cases, it's in support of what customers need. But in many cases, too, it's leading them down a path, right? Because customers mm-hmm. need help in making decisions. Yeah. You know, in many cases, you know, you talk to your customer sponsor, and the last thing they want to do is knock on the CFO's door because they know they're going to get asked about spreadsheets and ROI and all those things that normally they have to be responsible for. But what if you had that already set up for them? It's already tailored for them in this experience. They can simply invite the CFO into the room and allow them to look at the ROI, the payback, and other information. So it's really designed to help guide and direct the customer to help them make a more informed decision, an easier decision internally. Yeah, because we in in many ways, we've fallen victim to this idea that's that everybody we've been talking about for the last 10 years or so about, oh, well, the buyer is so much more informed than ever, you know, the buyer is in control. But the reality is that, yes, the buyer has access to a lot more information than they ever had. That doesn't necessarily mean they're more informed. In a lot of ways, that means they're more overwhelmed. And in fact, if in many cases, that's what's led to people making no decisions and no choices rather than uh, selecting a competitor. So, Something like this is really helping to overcome that kind of information overload. Yeah, look, we all want to be confident in the decisions we make, right? If we're on the consumer side, the buying mm-hmm. side, I know I want to make a good decision on my, my personal life or my business life. So to some extent, the person who can help them make that best decision possible. And again, it's consensus decision making today, right? Few people make singular decisions yeah, in the business absolutely. world. So they've got to build consensus and often one person can say no or not now. And that's where it comes back, like you mentioned, deals just stall. So if I can help them overcome that and give them the confidence and the platform that they could build consensus with all their key decision makers, I'm more apt to win those types of deals. Yeah, and to that point as well is those different people who are involved in the buying process play different roles, have different motivations, different things are important to them. And it's very difficult if you're doing this in an ad hoc way to serve up what each individual needs. Yeah, you know, as as I think we all know, John, you know, sales has a tendency to sell to the path of least resistance and in some cases to our friends, right? We know certain people and we hear this all the time. Our group is really good with the CIO's organization. They got great relationships. They're really bad when I get to the business side Mm -hmm. or vice versa. But the the beauty of this of the smart room is it normalizes that. Yeah, I've got information in there for the CIO and for that persona. I've got the relevant business information. So I may not be personally as good and understanding the business issues, but the room can carry the day. And I can, by the way, have a subject matter expert in that room too for my company that can help carry the day for me. So it really helps to normalize the decision-making process. And I'm not necessarily continuing to go down the path, you know, of the path of least resistance where the people I know and I'm, you know, ultimately my comfort zone. And I think that's a I think that's an important point just to underline there is that idea that we're not just talking about on the buyer side, you know, there's more people involved. On the seller side, 
to say you should be involving more people, and especially if you're going to be selling in a in a more digital or virtual way right now, you have the capacity, as you say, to bring in subject matter experts uh, that maybe you didn't have that opportunity before. Maybe you didn't have sales engineers who could come on every call with you or, or whatever. But now you can bring in different different experts, and I think that lends a whole new level of of customer experience and of credibility. It is, and you know, John, as we've all seen in the past, some of the best sales reps are the best quarterbacks, right? They know how yeah. to take advantage of the right resources. And one thing I always told the sales teams and support teams, I said, "Look, you kind of earn the right of the sales reps to get invited in front of customers. So if you're mm-hmm. good and you advance the selling process, you'll get invited. If you're not, you don't. And that's just the way yeah. the process works. So, but this is a process to really take someone, you know, kind of from one meeting." And really begin to kind of, you know, scale them beyond, you know, anything they've done before with videos, online presentations and things like that. Podcasts, you have ways to scale people and get them out there further and further. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the thing is, right, that you have all the tools that you need in order to be able to do this today. The problem is uh, organizing and knowing how to use these tools, which is obviously then what you have done. Yeah. And it still doesn't take away the human side of this, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, so much of sales is process driven, but we always talk about the agility of selling, right? So yeah. I have a great process. I know it's worked really well for these last five deals, but this client's a little different. You know, they they have their own set of issues. They're making decisions a little differently. You know, it's more financially driven than technical driven. And we hear that all the time. So we have to be agile too. So the system has to drive process, but at the same time, I as a sales rep need to listen, understand, and be agile with the system so I can continue to tailor it exactly with how that customer wants to make the decision. Yeah, and obviously you have more opportunity, right, to be able to be a little bit more aware and to be listening and to be doing that investigation and really trying to understand what's going on with the customer, the different people in the buying process, if you're not distracted by a load of mundane organizational tasks. Yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, that's the thing with sales reps. I mean, the beauty of digital is it, it almost creates, you know, a path that once you set it in motion, it will continue to execute for you. And again, you can execute generically, which it will run, or you can continue to tailor it exactly with the way the client wants. And you have the choice and option. And we see reps doing both. Some will take it the way it is, put it out in front of customers. It will run. It will engage. It'll do work. Others will spend a lot of time tailoring the story, the message, and really tweaking it to exactly the conversation at hand with the customer. And, and, and both work at some level, always the more personalized, mm-hmm. the better, though. Yeah, and, and I guess an experience like this, one, one of the things that, that uh, you often see and, and we often hear about is uh, not, qualifying, not qualifying opportunities well enough. Right. And that and that's a that's a, an age old problem. So you end up with a lot of stuff in the early stages of the pipeline that shouldn't really be there. When you get into a process like this, you really are uh, almost forced to qualify better. Yeah, and, and, and we like to say we bring the qualification to the sales rep. So you know, if I'm digitally engaging with multiple opportunities and multiple accounts, I'm looking at the activity, and I can begin to see you know when a customer's leaning in and when there's real interest mm-hmm. there. And one of the things we, we see all the time and we kind of coach our teams on it, you know, when customers begin to invite their colleagues into a room, like they may come in every once in a while and be a tire kicker and look at stuff. And that's fine. That's a certain, they're still in the early education phase. But when they start bringing people and no one wastes other people's time today, yeah. and they start bringing in that initial cohort of people that help them to make a decision, that's when you lean in and say, okay, how can I help? Or you bring some subject matter experts in that help, help support the persona that, that, more recently entered the room with you. Yeah, and 100% because uh, as we know that another great mistake that uh, that sales people often make is is when they engage with the, with the prospect but they don't the prospect isn't really engaging with them. You may I may have a meeting with you and then at the end of it you agree to have a meeting with me in 2 weeks time. But between now and two weeks, you're not doing anything. You're not engaged in it. I'm I'm engaged in the process. You're not. So to your point, if you can see people are bringing people in and that you, you're seeing the engagement on their side. 
Yeah, and I think it's that false hope. You know, when we have these first meetings, again, customers are using it to educate. We yeah. think we're advancing a selling process, but they're still in an education phase. Mm -hmm. It may not even be a project for them this year. There may not be budget, but somehow it lands in our pipeline as a qualified opportunity, right? And that's why, you know, back to your comment earlier, why so many deals stall. It's, well, they didn't stall. They just were never there to begin with, right? So right. we misconstrued something that was an active pursuit because, look, salespeople mm -hmm. are optimist. They're positive. You know, we, we expect things to happen. We want things to happen. But when you start really looking at the, you know, empirical data, is my customer actively engaged? Yeah. Are they showing me the right buying signals? That's when I lean in and say, okay, these are the ones that, but the only way that really works though, is that I'm gauging everywhere. Again, this is one of the biggest problems that sales reps have always had. You know, if I'm chasing, you know, 30 or 40 different things, I honestly can only be active in five or six of them. But can I continue to engage at least digitally across the board here? So as these things begin to kind of slowly mature over the time, Again, I'm cherry picking my way to the ones that obviously are more qualified and really deserve my time and attention. Yeah, and I think that gets back to the idea of you know, that the quality, you know, that you're able to raise your quality and the value of what you're doing as opposed to spreading yourself very thin. And yeah, I like to call that syndrome happy years, by the way, is uh, <laughs> when. When I may talk to you and after our conversation, I'll take a few little sound bites. I'll add them all together and I'll say, oh, yeah, he's really interested. And he said there's a there's absolutely there's a budget for it. And you never said any of that. You may have <laughs> intimated different things, but I pull them all together. <laughs> it's the great sales filter we put on, right? So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, before we end here, um, what would you say to companies right now who are who are for the maybe for the first time or maybe seriously for the first time looking at uh, digital processes when it comes to sales? How would you advise them to start this process? Yeah, I, th I think for today too, John. When I think of today, the moment in time we're talking right now, again, mm -hmm. you know, we know our customers are in flux. Many companies are in flux. You know, it may not be the time to sell hard right now. I don't think anybody mm -hmm. would recommend that. But it is time to engage and maintain some level of engagement with our customers right now. You know, Sales 101 was always about show up and show up more often than the competitors, right? So show up, show up digitally. It's a more passive way sometimes. Educate them, give them information. We have a customer right now that's building a smart room just around COVID-19 support for their customers on how for right. them to work with it and handle situations like this with their employees, with their customers. It's simply to educate them, but they're making that investment in them because we know they know their customers want that information. So think about those types of things that really help to set you apart today, help the customer with what's important to them today. And then over time, when things do open up, you'll be the one that have earned the right to bring those deals down. Yeah, it's fantastic. Listen, all of Bill's information will be in the contributor bio, all the links to Journey Sales and more information about the smart rooms. But before we go, Bill, tell people a little bit more about your company and your smart room product. Sure, thanks, John. Yeah, you know, we started this journey about four years ago, really, with the idea that, you know, the sales and account management world needed, you know, a digital experience here. So, you know, we started Journey Sales with that. You know, historically, we worked with a lot of early adopters, the ones who kind of saw this as a real opportunity and a way to differentiate themselves. And I think more recently, those early adopters became all mainstream people, too. So now the mainstream is beginning to ask the question, you know, since I don't have the option right now to sell the old way, how do I sell digitally? So, uh, yeah, if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, they can uh, contact me at bbutler at journeysales.com or they can find me on LinkedIn also. Yeah, and, and just one other note, uh, as we said, this is a great time to look at your digital processes. But to be honest, a lot of people, even though this crisis is on, a lot of people are more open to uh, being connected with digitally than ever before. A lot of people are experiencing uh, being being remote and virtual and at home for the first time. And so uh, this actually can be a very, very good time to, to create good digital, connect, digital and uh, personal connections. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, or CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.